Hello everyone, welcome back. Today I have another blog post to share with you. This one is titled, Preparing for the Rapture and Judgment Day, The Road to Zion. Which, if you've been following this channel, you know that uh, I believe it's going to be this fall of 2024. So let's just dive straight into the scripture, to Jeremiah 50. In those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, they and their children of uh, of Judah together, going and weeping. They shall go and seek the Lord their God. They shall ask the way to Zion with their faces to their word, saying, Come, let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. Jeremiah 54. So the theme of this post is uh, how do we ask the way to Zion? How do we get from where we are to there? Um, and the premise of this channel is that the day of Jehovah is coming by the end of the 70th Jubilee, from the time that they originally entered the Promised Land in 1406 BC. That puts it at 2024. Uh, And that's when everything is supposed to kick off with a very big bang, uh, a nuclear bang, if you've been watching my videos. So if you have any doubt, uh, here are some links to some videos that will get you up to speed pretty quickly. You can find a link to this Medium post from the description in the YouTube video. uh, And from there, you can find these other videos. Or you can just go to my channel and look for them. Regardless of the accuracy of the predictions, we can all die at any time. And when we wake up from our sleep, we will be at Judgment Day. So uh, this advice does apply to everyone. Now here is what I believe is got to be one of the most humbling verses in the entire Bible. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, Have we not prophesied in your name, and in your name cast out devils, and in your name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity or lawlessness. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. So if you don't know for sure that you're doing his will uh, and um, you know, that you're not practicing iniquity or lawlessness uh, or you're not obeying his commands, then this message is a wake-up call. Um, because... You know, it's, it's hard to find his commands and to understand what did he tell us to do and what not. And a lot of people these days are teaching that there's nothing you have to do other than accept Yeshua. Yes, without Yeshua, we cannot be saved. We cannot earn our way into heaven. But uh, we also uh, have to go and sin no more and obey his commandments. Um, and let's look at what those are. Because this will tell us how to make sure that we are ready for the rapture and that we don't miss it. Uh, Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. Another humbling verse. Uh, If you find that you're doing things that are very similar to everyone else in your life, even Christians, uh, if you're with the vast majority... Uh, then that should be a warning sign because it says few. So if you look around and you see many people that are just like you, uh, then that might be a warning sign that uh, you're on the broad path and not the narrow path. Uh, And my my point here is not to say that I've got all the answers, but just to say a very humble approach. Let's not say in pride that we found everything and that we're ready to go, Uh, but that we seek to follow him and to prepare ourselves. And I think one of the biggest traps that the rapture watchmen, myself included, uh, we can fall into is being so eager to escape this world 
that we get excited about every potential theory and rationalization for the rapture at every single feast day for the past several years. It says, Woe unto you that desire the day of Jehovah. To what end is it for you? The day of Jehovah is darkness and not light. All right? So if we're so excited about the day of Jehovah and the rapture, uh, we've lost sight of something because we should not be uh, so yearning for that day um, because, you know, woe to you who desire it. But we must balance this with uh, what Paul says. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all of them that love his appearing. So as watchmen, those who desire the rapture, we love his appearing. We can't wait for him to get here. We're very excited about that. That's what Paul says, but you know we're in a catch-22 because his appearing and the day of Jehovah are the same. So woe to you who desire that day, but you should love his appearing. How do we reconcile these two things? I think that we can resolve it if we consider the character of Jehovah. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, his promise that he will return and that we may be where he is in his father's house. As some men would count slackness. But he is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, the proper attitude for us is to be long-suffering and patient and not willing that any should perish. Uh, this means that we should be praying for as much time as possible to save people rather than praying that he come quickly. Uh, we should be praying that the rapture isn't this year, but many years from now. Um, Revelation 2.16 puts a point on it. Repent, or else I will come unto you quickly. This verse could imply that a quick coming is a punishment for the unrepentant. What does that imply about those who are hoping for a quick coming? Seems like the best way to assure a quick coming is to go on sinning without repenting. That said, the timing of his coming is as fixed as the timing of the sun, moon, and stars. Scripture tells us that when that day will come uh, is... Um, Sorry, scripture tells us exactly when that day will come. And it gives us a very real and urgent and tragically literal deadline. So instead, we should view it like a race where our time is running out to store up treasures in heaven. It's like if you're in a game show and there's a competition, you've got to collect as much as you can before the time runs out. You don't pray that the game's over so you can get your treasure. You pray for as much time as possible so you can collect as much as possible. Um, so lay not up for yourselves treasures here on earth where moth and rust uh, do corrupt and where thieves break in and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven right? this is a command this is an instruction we are to lay up treasures in heaven some people think that it's uh, optional that oh that's a bonus you know I'm saved that's all I need I don't need treasures in heaven I'm just happy to get there well, he instructed us, if we're obeying his commandments, we should be laying up treasures in heaven, uh, where neither moth nor rust can uh, destroy. It's because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Well, your heart, where, where do you want to be when you're after Your heart, your soul, up in heaven. Yeah, if you don't have any treasures there, because you're not laying any treasures up in heaven, then where is your heart going to be? So with this mindset on heavenly treasures... Every day before the rapture is a blessing, uh, even if it is in much suffering and hardship. Uh, and that's a really tough thing for a lot of people because this life is hard, especially for people that are in war zones and other places. Here in the United States, we've got it really good. Even though there's war going on around the world, uh, life is still pretty good in the United States. Um, compared to the rest of the world. Uh, but that is not, um, you know, no matter how hard it is, every day is an opportunity to suffer for him 
and store up treasures. All right, so now that we've established that, let's look at the instructions from Jehovah about his day. And I think the number one most important instruction is that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes and trusts in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16. We've all heard that one. But belief in this context is about trust and obedience and is not just mental acknowledgement because even the devils believe and they tremble. Uh, so likewise, wasn't Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? This is in Jericho. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so is faith without works is also dead. So whoever has faith will not perish, but faith without works is dead. So the mention of Rahab is very relevant because the story of Jericho is a shadow for the coming rapture. Rahab was brought out of the city right after the last trumpet with a shout and before the city was burned. And there are other parallels in the story as well. So if we look at the instructions for Rahab and she was justified or she was saved by works, which demonstrated her faith, right? Because you don't do works if you don't have faith. Um, there. So by analogy, faith is our body and works is our spirit. We are saved by the blood of Yeshua and by our faith in his mercy. But our faith is proven by our works and our obedience. Likewise, works without faith is like wine without wineskins to hold it. You know, you got all this spirit, but you can't hold on to it. Uh, so you do not think you can earn your way into heaven, but you do not think that nothing is expected of you either. For, <clears throat> for the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I do the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but the sin that dwells within me. Romans 7, 19. So this is Paul talking about how even though he wants to do everything and follow all the commands, he is still subject to his flesh and still sins. But we cannot sit back and blame our flesh for every sin. We must confess with our mouth that it is sin and do our best to repent and resist the flesh. <clears throat> So, however, if I do the very thing that I do not want to do, I agree or I confess with the law that the law is good. So a lot of people like to say that because he paid for our sins, there is no more sin. That's like saying someone paid for your speeding ticket. There's no more speed limit. The speed limit is still there. Someone just paid the price for it. We cannot go on speeding just because we know that we have someone who's going to pay the price for it. it does not do away with the law it just uh, covers us under the law it does away with the penalty from the law it does not do away with the law we're supposed to go and sin no more so if we sin willfully after we have received knowledge of the truth there remains no more sacrifice for sins of how much worse punishment suppose you shall he be thought deserving who tr has trodden under the foot of the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant by which you are sanctified an unholy thing and has done uh, despite unto the Spirit of grace. Basically, you've grieved the Spirit of grace. So we've got to be very careful to, to do our best uh, to not sin anymore uh, and to understand the law uh, and his commandments. Uh, and his commandments are not just all those Old Testament stuff. There's lots of commands in the Bible if you go looking for them. Lots of instructions. And we're going to review some of those instructions to help us prepare for this very time. Um, so the Old Testament is full of prophecy for the day of Jehovah. But we have to view it more than just information about what's going to happen. But as instructive, the commands he gives in those verses and through those prophets apply to this generation. I challenge you to read through the scripture Looking for instructions, you can attempt to follow. If you don't look, you won't notice. But once you do look, they pop out at you. 
Ignorance may be bliss, but willful, willful ignorance, that is sin. So now that you are properly motivated to be doers of the word, proactively searching for instructions, let us get to the instructions for this dark day. Uh, so let's go to Joel 2. Let all of the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of Jehovah cometh. For it is nigh at hand, and Jehovah shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executes his word. For the day of Jehovah is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? This is an instruction. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. If you are not trembling, then you do not understand what is coming. Uh, you are too comfortable. Uh, and so study and tremble because he says tremble. Um, so he's full of mercy, but he's coming with power and might to judge. And we should all be embarrassed by our sins and be asking for his mercy by the blood of Yeshua. Now, he is faithful and just to forgive us, but nevertheless, we cannot rest uh, and you know, sit back and say, hey, you, know, you may have heard the REM song. It's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. Feeling fine and trembling are not compatible. We put our faith in Yeshua and he will save us. But uh, if we are like our master and following his instructions, then feeling fine is not the appropriate response. You know, the response we'll see is mourning and sorrow and uh, a bunch of other things that we should be feeling because, you know, we might be saved, but billions of people are about to die. And he cares about those billions of people just as much as he cares about you. So if we have his heart and his mind and we are and we know him, we will be grieved and sorrowful as he is grieved and sorrowful by this day. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress with the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. Revelation 19.15 So let's look at what the Word of God is. The Word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even through the division of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart. You cannot hide anything from him, so do not deceive yourself. Search your heart, mind, and soul. Take every thought captive and make it obedient. It is our flesh nature that we should be trembling because it has no place to hide. Our flesh should be afraid because when you rapture, our flesh dies. Uh, so our flesh definitely should be trembling, whether we burn in the fire or we are saved. Um, so, but we're also given the following instruction. Keep awake, watch, uh, at all times, praying that you may have this full strength and ability and be accounted worthy to escape these things that will take place and to stand in the presence of the Son of Man. Pray always that we are counted worthy. Uh, so we should not assume worthiness to escape, but we should be praying that we are accounted. Those who in pride say that they are worthy that they're guaranteed to be raptured, they fall into a trap. Those who in humility obey this command and assume they may not be worthy may be invited up instead. Uh, so, but instead pray in faith and obedience that, and then you will be lifted up. So it's, it's one of those things where if you get so comfortable, that, hey, I'm going to be safe, you know, I'm, I'm all in the clear, I'm going up. Uh, that's... Then you stop praying that you're counted worthy because, hey, you're assuming that you're worthy. Why do you need to pray that you're counted worthy if, if uh, you already know that you're worthy, right? That's, um, that's the danger. You know, let's, let's consider the following. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give tithes to all I possess. Thank you that I'm going to be taken in the rapture and not die like everyone else. Right? That's the spirit of that prayer, 
of the Pharisee. The tax collector, on the other hand, says, standing afar off, would not so much as lift up his eyes unto heaven. And he smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Yeshua says, I tell you, this man went to his house justified. (laughs) You go up to heaven, you're taken to our heavenly home justified, rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. So by declaring your worthiness, you are exalting yourself, uh, even through the blood of Yeshua. When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, which we've all been invited to a wedding, do not take the place of honor. For some more distinguished than you may have been invited. uh, And he who invited you both will come to you and say, give your place to this man. And then in disgrace, you proceed to occupy the last place. But when you are invited, go and recline at the last place so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher, come on up. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So we've been invited to a wedding feast. We should be resting at the lowest place, resting or waiting at the lowest place. The lowest place is the one who goes through tribulation to be refined by fire. That doesn't mean that the pre-tribulation rapture isn't going to happen. It only means that some of us may be too attached to our worldly life or too prideful. This is the difference between the barley and the wheat harvest. Barley seeds easily separate in the wind, but the wheat requires physical scraping. So if you will not humble yourself, he will humble you. For the day of Jehovah's host shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, upon everyone that is lifted up, he shall be brought low. So do not be assuming that you deserve a place lifted up, but you know, rest assuming you're going through tribulation and pray for mercy, and that you will be counted worthy to be lifted up. Don't assume that you are, because only he can judge whether or not you are worthy. Um, so, uh, you, you should rend, repent, rend your heart. Therefore also, saith Jehovah, turn, repent everyone to me, even with all your heart. In Second Chronicles it says, Because your heart was tender, and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against the place and its inhabitants, right? When you heard about the coming judgment, and you humbled yourself before me, and you tore your clothes, and you wept before me, I have also heard you. So if we're not so humbled that we are rending our clothes and weeping before him, uh, then he, is he going to hear us? Um, now, we're supposed to rend our heart and not our clothes, right? He doesn't care about, you know, physically. Let's just symbolically. Nevertheless, our hearts should be broken um, with mercy and sorrow. So, so rend your heart and not your garments. Return to Jehovah your, your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. All right, well, if you do rend your heart, then yes, he will relent. But if we are so confident that, hey, we've already been forgiven, we are saved, and we're no longer of the right humility in, in the face of this coming day of judgment, just five months from now, then, uh, you know, where is that going to leave us? It's going to leave you in a precarious spot. I'm not the judge. I'm just providing the interpretation of what I see in the scripture saying. Um, let the scripture speak to you. Um, don't, don't let any man, me or anyone else, tell you whether or not you are or are not worthy. That's not our job. I'm just bringing the scripture to you. Now it says, fast and humble yourself. So it says, repent with fasting and weeping and with mourning. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast. And Yeshua replied to them, Can the wedding guests mourn while the bridegroom is with them? 
the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. So he's not with us right now. He's coming. But since he's not with us, we should be fasting and mourning and repenting. Uh, since we're five months away, there's no better time to fast. If you're not used to fasting, uh, you know you can start with a, a one-day fast and then work up two to three-day fast. Um, but you want to basically submit your flesh to your spirit. Uh, and when you do fast, then great things can happen and you can start working things. Like There are certain miracles that, and healing and demons can only be cast out through prayer and fasting. So do not deny yourself the power of fasting. I think we can look at Daniel's prayer before being given the vision of the 70 Jubilees, which is the whole premise of our timeline, uh, is what our attitude should be at this time. So let's, let's look at Daniel. <clears throat> In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years. That's where we are. We now understand by the books the number of years. Uh, where he would accomplish his 70 years, which is Jubilees, uh, in the desolations of Jerusalem, and by analogy, Babylon. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So once he understood the timing, then he did this. And he prayed unto him, and he made his confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, Keep keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him. So he's great and dreadful, even as he's keeping the covenant of mercy. And to those that keep his commandments, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us, yet we made not our prayer before the Lord our God, and we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. So this is, Moses predicted this, and Daniel saying, hey, uh, all this stuff has happened to us, but we haven't prayed and repented and fasted uh, and all the things that Moses said we're supposed to do when we break the covenant that he might have mercy on us. Therefore, has the Lord looked upon the evil and brought it upon us? For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works, which he does, for we obeyed not his voice. So we are saved from our sins when we obey. Because even though we're obeying, we're still going to be sinners. We still have sins in the past. We're still going to sin in the future. But we're expected to go and sin no more. We're expected to obey. Um, and so is your heart one of, I will obey? Or is your heart one of, there are no commands I need to follow because I am forgiven? That is the question you need to ask yourself. It says, weep, wail, mourn, that you may be comforted. It says, let the priests, the ministers of Jehovah, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, spare thy people, O Jehovah, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them, wherefore they should say among the people, where is their God? Weeping, wailing, mourning. Those are all things he's feeling about the coming judgment, like a parent having to punish their children. But if you want to be comforted, right, and those are who are taken to Zion are those who will be comforted. You know, uh, they are the ones. If you're not weeping, wailing, and mourning, if you don't have that spirit in you, then you're not going to be comforted. Um, that's my understanding of it anyway. It says, call a solemn assembly, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly, those who are of thee and to whom the, and to whom the reproach of it was a burden. So he's going to gather, rapture, those who are sorrowful for the solemn assembly. So the rapture is a solemn assembly. Uh, who the, the reproach, the sin, was a burden, and we feel the weight of the sin. If we're not feeling the weight uh, and, and sorrowful of it, um, we are missing the point. Then there are the commands to watch 
Watch, watch. Set up the standard upon the walls of Babylon. Make the watch strong. Set up the watchmen, prepare the ambushes. For Jehovah has both devised and done that which he spoke against the inhabitants of Babylon. This right here is a critical verse for all those who say the fall of Babylon is the wrath of Satan or the wrath of man, not the wrath of God. It says Jehovah has both devised and done what he's bringing on Babylon. Uh, So that makes it his wrath, not Satan's wrath, not man's wrath, his wrath. And we are not appointed to wrath those who know him, love him, and obey his commandments. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched, and he would not have suffered his house to be broken up. And he comes unto the disciples and finds them asleep and says unto Peter, Could you not watch with me one hour? Now, I'm going to do a study on this later, but the phrase one hour refers to the fall of Babylon. That's a a symbol. And when you look at every place the phrase one hour is used uh, in the Bible, it's very clear that that is a reference to the fall of Babylon. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation or to trial and tribulation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. That would be us. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house comes, whether it's uh, in the evening or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning. Least he come suddenly and find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. So we are all commanded to watch. You know, blow the trumpet, sound the alarm. So once you watch, you need to warn. That's what the blowing the trumpet is, sounding the alarm. If the watchman sees the sword, which in the context of tribulation is the nukes coming, and blows not the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and if the sword or judgment comes, and any person from them um, is killed by it, he is taken away in his iniquity. Right? You killed by the judgment? Yeah, you deserved it. But the blood will be on the watchman's hand. Uh, so Yeshua commanded us all to watch, not just the pastors. That means that we are all appointed watchmen. That means we are all liable for the blood of anyone we didn't warn. This topic cannot be, it's not fun to share with people. Uh, People don't want to hear that Judgment Day is coming. Um, And it can be awkward or embarrassing. But just keep in mind that if you fear him and you are trembling, uh, you want to be found obeying his commands, which means warning them, because you should fear him and the judgment more than any social consequences of warning people. says, uh, we are to be like our master and walk as Yeshua walked. And then when we love and warn our enemies, we should not want the day of Jehovah to fall on anyone. So, you know, you've got those people in your life that you don't like so much. What you don't want to say is, hey, judgment day is coming. I hope you burn in hell. You say judgment day is coming. I hope you repent. And you should warn them. You should not say to yourself, I'm not going to say anything to them because I don't want them to repent. Because then you're taking the attitude of Jonah, who uh, sat outside of Nineveh and was waiting for judgment to fall on them and was mad when they repented. That is not the attitude that you want to have. An easy way to you, for you to blow the trumpet and to warn people is to share these posts with your friends and family and then subscribe to get additional updates. All right. All you, you don't have to come up with the original messages and uh, you know, parse through all the scripture yourself. You can just relay what other watchmen are finding and share it and get the message out. 
um, it's not that hard. So subscribe, uh, enable notifications, and then share with everyone you know because this information is vitally important. If you love them, then they need to know this information so that they have time to turn, repent, and prepare themselves for Judgment Day. Then we're supposed to serve spiritual meat at the appropriate time. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? It's whom the Lord has made ruler over his entire household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord uh, uh, finds doing when he comes. So he wants to find us giving meat, which is deep spiritual insight and wisdom at the appropriate time in due season. Uh, and if he finds you doing that, you are a faithful and wise servant. So by warning people, by sharing this information with people, you are providing meat. Uh, and that makes you a faithful and wise servant. All right, now I'm going to get to something that's going to be uh, hard for a lot of people, but uh, let's get into it. You need to get out of debt and forgive debts. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. At the end of every seven years, you must cancel debts. You may require payment from a foreigner, but you must cancel any debt to your brother or your brother Messiah. Uh, who, who owes you? We are currently in the seventh year, the year of release. Uh, and on the year of release at the Feast of Tabernacles is when the debts are released and wiped out. So failure to repay those whom you borrowed uh, will be like theft because they're releasing you from that debt on that day and you won't owe it back to them anymore. Uh, they will release you from the debt and forgive you your sin this year. But that is not an excuse not to repay. Likewise, if you have lent to anyone, do not demand it back. It is the year of release, and we all have debts of sin that we cannot repay. So demanding payment from those whom you have been commanded to forgive is a form of theft. So unlike past years, this year is when we are released from the debt of sin. This is the year we are raptured. This is the, the year the dead in Christ rise. Uh, so this is a very important year to honor this particular principle because this is the fulfillment of the type and shadow. Uh, but when I say to the wicked, you will certainly die. And he turns from his sin and practices what is just, fair, and right. If a wicked man returns what he took as a pledge for security for a loan. So if you borrowed money and you've posted some security, you know, whether it's your house or a car loan or some other security, you do as a wicked man returns what he took. He pays back what has been taken by robbery. Uh, he walks in the statutes that ensure life without committing injustice. He will certainly live. He will not die. None of his sins that he has committed will be remembered against him. He has practiced that which is fair just and right, he will most certainly live. But when I say to the righteous that you will most certainly live, and he trusts in his previous acts of righteousness to save him, and he commits injustice, none of his righteous deeds will be remembered, but he will die for the injustice that he has committed. Now, many will say this is Old Testament. We are now saved by grace through faith. But let's consider the whole scripture. For none is righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have all together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. So if none are righteous, then to whom is Ezekiel 33 speaking? When I say to the righteous that he'll most certainly live. He is speaking to those who are covered by Messiah. It's only through his blood that we are made righteous. So if we rest in that covering and we willfully sin, where does that put us? We must repent and return and do what is right. And a wicked man re returns what he took as a pledge for a loan. Uh, and you pay back what you can. So if you borrow money, you need to pay it back by the year of release. This is the year of release. 
Now, don't worry if you can't, because we all have sins that we cannot pay back. We all have debts that we cannot pay. That's not the point. The point is you don't want to add to your sins or rest in your sins and say, oh, I can just um, keep it. So let's uh, get to the next one. Skip the bunker building. If you've seen my video in the nuclear war, all the places where it's described in the Bible, then you know, one of the first things I hear from people, particularly post-tribulation believers, is uh, they start thinking about beans, bullets, bullion, and bunkers. This is most prevalent from people who don't believe in the pre-tribulation because, hey, if nuclear war is coming, I've got to be ready to survive it. Not only that, but the mark of the beast. <clears throat> but here's, here's what the Bible says. He who flees from the fear shall fall into the pit, and he who gets out of the pit shall be caught in a snare. You can't run, you can't hide. Judgment Day is coming for for you. And if you know you flee and you escape the nuke, you're gonna get trapped in your in a pit in your bunker. And if you get out of that, you'll be caught in a snare. Um you can't run from it. And it also says Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of Jehovah's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by fire and his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. So your gold, your silver, your beans, your bullets, your bullion, your bunkers will not save you in that day. Uh, At best, it will prolong your suffering. You'd be better off dying in the nuclear blast uh, than suffering for weeks or months uh, through starvation and radiation poisoning. So it's just not a good plan to try to survive because it says Babylon will never be built again. It will be desolate wasteland. Uh, So this is especially true if you live in Babylon, but even the country of the north that's attacking us, which I believe is bricks, they're going to suffer damage. They're going to suffer wounds by the sword, but they will survive and they will be healed. I think that's what it says. It says the beast suffered a a head wound by the sword, but he lived. I I think that's just the nukes go both ways. It doesn't matter which side of this nuclear war you're going to be on. You're going to take losses, but one side is going to survive. Even thus it shall be in the day of the Son of Man is revealed. In that day he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come back down and take it away. He is in the field, let him not return back to it. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. And this is right in the context of the rapture. Two women shall be grinding together. One will be taken, one left. Two men shall be in the field, one taken, the other left. So if we try to save our fleshly life, we will lose our spiritual life. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Lot's wife looked back, even after the angels had taken them out of the city. So it... I've, I've seen some people claim they've had rapture dreams where you're first taken out of the city to meet somewhere and then go up. Um, if those dreams have anything to do with what happened with Lot, where the angels took them out of the city and then she looked back, and then, you know, you're not safe just because the, the angels take you out of the city. You want to make sure that you are not looking back with any attachment to what is about to burn in the fire. Um so now is the time to let go of any attachment to this life. Right? We've got to lose this life and the people and the things in it. Your plans for the future, your retirement, your career, and any unfinished business, you need to move quickly through any stages of grief and acceptance. Do not be attached to this life, or you will hesitate when the angels come to gather you, and you may end up being left behind feeling salty. But... His wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. So, post-tribulation rapture, 
This is a major issue with both mid- and post-tribulation rapture theory. Under this theory, the scriptures are provided to warn us to prepare in order to save our lives. We are told that we will not be able to buy or sell without taking the mark, and that the cost of resistance is death. My thinking is that for those living in nuclear nations, the mark of the beast will be the last thing you have to worry about. One third of the world will die in the opening act. We are told that Babylon the Great sits over the whole earth and will be thrown down in a single hour. And if my interpretation is correct, there will be nuclear war and few in Babylon the Great will survive and only as refugees. The only way to even attempt to prepare is to leave Babylon the Great immediately and find the most remote island far from any major world powers that are likely to be involved in nuclear war. You would have to stock food for seven years so you don't have to buy or sell or take the mark. Your crops would fail because a third of the sun will be blocked. Uh, and if you are following his commands, you would not be planting this year nor next because of the Sabbath year and the Jubilee year. Given we are less than five months away, you better start praying that you are mistaken about a post-tribulation rapture. Uh, so you can see how this doctrine of the post-tribulation rapture encourages us to try to hold on and to survive and to save our life through the tribulation um, instead of trusting and having faith that he's going to rapture and save us out of the tribulation, like he saved Lot, like he saved Noah, like he saved Rahab. Um, so uh, check out this video here about nuclear war and the rapture uh, and the fall of Babylon uh, for more evidence of who this is and why it's going to be nuclear war. So the conclusion, all who humble themselves and call on the name of Jehovah will be saved through the blood of Yeshua, their repentance and their obedience to his commands. If you are not scouring the word for his instructions in this time, then you are taking a big risk. The dragon was wroth with the woman, and he went to make war with her, the remnant of her seed, who keep the commandments of Jehovah and have the testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach. I pray that you receive this message with, um, with the love that was intended and without judgment, for we have all sinned, we all fall short, and no one is keeping any of their commands. We should not boast in how well we keep his commands, but because we love him, we keep his commands. Please subscribe, share, and warn as many as people as you can. The time is short. Thank you.